Welcome back. Today we're going to continue our study of cancer and begin to look at something called carcinogenesis. Carcinogenesis is the birth or the development of cancer. And to add to your definitions, the carcinogens are those things in our world that cause cancer, and they are divided into the physical, the chemical, and the biologic agents that are cancer-causing. We also will talk a lot about etiology, which is the cause of any disease, and then also epidemiology you've already heard about, and that's the study of, of large populations and geographical areas, looking at the uh, endemic diseases, epidemic diseases, and trying to put together with the populations what those causes might be. Going back a little bit, if you want to talk a little bit about epidemiology, uh, in 1755, we probably had the first connection between cancer and an, uh, an environmental agent, Sir Percival Pott, who was a pathologist in England and who has a number of diseases named after him, noticed that there was a prevalence of scrotal cancers, cancers on the skin of the scrotum, in chimney sweeps. And these were little boys, usually, who wore an outfit, a suit of clothing, and they were tied to a rope and lowered down into a chimney where they swept out all the coal tars. And these boys got these skin cancers on their scrotum, and it was, according to Pott and turned out to be true, the constant contact of the coal tar against the scrotal skin. What was interesting was the French chimney sweeps didn't get this because they washed their clothes every day. And the English ones didn't, so they had constant coal tar residues. And we can do that now with mice. If you shave mice and put coal tars on them, we are, can easily produce skin cancers in mice. About four years later, Dr. John Hill in England noticed the association of cancers of the nose and the oral cavity in patients who chewed uh, tobacco or inhaled snuff. He made the connection, of course, didn't know why that happened, uh, but that was noted. And then in 1950, there were two sets of investigators who really ended a very long debate. And actually, when, if you look at the world today, it's really not ended. Uh, but Dahl and Hill in one publication and Winder and Graham separately noted the relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And Winder was at Sloan Kettering when I was at Cornell, and he used to come and give the pathology lectures to us. And in those days, one of the cigarette companies always advertised a real cigarette. And Winder would come in, and he'd reach into his pocket, and he'd say, smoke a real cigarette. You get real cancer. And he would crumple it up and throw it away. And he said, I love New York. You wake up to the coughing of the birds. Anyway, this is the history of how we found etiologic agents in the cause of cancer. There's a very strong geographical uh, bias and a racial bias in who gets cancer and who doesn't. The geography is rather interesting. Um, in Japan, there was a very high risk of gastric cancers probably attributed to eating lots of smoked foods. That risk is starting to disappear as habits change. And there was, for example, a very low incidence of uterine cervical cancer in Israel, probably due to specific sexual practices and circumcision. If you look at some of the charts of incidence, and these are epi epidemiologic charts, they range from 1930 here to 2000. And in females, there's an interesting change in trend for lung cancer. And this had to do probably with the advent of the women's liberation movement right here, which made it much more acceptable for women to smoke. And lung cancer rose at a dramatic rate. And um, it was interesting that the incidence of breast cancer stayed about the same, but the death rate from lung cancer now exceeds the death rate from breast cancer. There are more breast cancers still, but lung cancer is so much more fatal that the death rate in women now from lung cancer exceeds that. Look at the decline in colon cancer and the decline here in men's colon cancer. 
That came about because of endoscopy. We started looking at colon cancers through the colonoscope. It turns out that almost all colon cancers start in a polyp in the colon, and we can take those out through the colonoscope. So now we're getting to these before they're full-blown cancers, and we've caused a huge decline in both incidents and then the death rate of the cancer. So there's lots of risk factors that we can attack. Lung cancer, very, very high in Asia, where people smoke much more heavily than in this country. Um, for example, also primary hepatic cancer, cancer of the liver in Asia is very high because of a combination of something called aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is a toxin that comes from a fungus called Aspergillus flavus, and asp aflatoxins occur in poorly stored grains, things like peanuts. This happens a lot in Asia, along with infections with hepatitis B virus. We need the two to give you liver cancer. And liver cancer is very common in Asia and Africa and virtually unheard of here. In 30 years, I saw one case of primary liver cancer. Now, you've probably all heard somebody say to you, oh, my aunt died of liver cancer. I can assure you, she probably didn't. This is the difference in primary cancer and the metastatic cancer, and I wanted to use this as the example. Where a cancer starts, for example, in the breast duct, it is then called ductal cancer of the breast, or ductal carcinoma. When that spreads to the brain or the liver, it's still breast cancer. It's not liver cancer. If I take a biopsy of that liver and hand it to the pathologist, if it's not really anaplastic or moderately differentiated at least, he'll look at it and say, that's breast cancer metastatic to the liver because you'll see normal liver cells and the metastatic cancer in it. Most of the time, they can make that determination. But it's very rare to see primary liver cancer, meaning that the liver cells was the start of the cancer. So we, I wanted to put that aside early on here. We see a lot of melanomas of the skin, which is a very serious malignant uh, growth in the skin due to ozone depletion in the southern hemisphere. There's a big hole in the ozone layer right over Australia and a very high incidence of both melanomas and also the other two kinds of skin cancer which are due to UV light. We're also having um, de uh, geographic shifts in this country where people are moving to the Sun Belt, spending more time out. Demographic shifts was what I really wanted to say. And they're spending more time, so lifestyle and geography changes are causing increase in this country as well of much, much more skin cancer. More than a million cases per year in America, especially of the non-melanoma types. There are racial components. For example, blacks are protected from the effects of UV light uh, by the, mel the melanin, which are benign uh, cells in the skin that creates the black pigment. This filters out those lights, and so skin cancers in blacks are much, much rarer, while Celtic populations uh, have fair skin, redhead-type complexion, and much more easily burned skin have a much higher rate of cancers of the skin. Poverty is also linked to cancer. Um, High rates because of dietary factors, alcohol and tobacco use, sedentary lifestyles. Uh, once again, just the way it is with infectious diseases, it's really not good to be poor. The environmental effects of this self-inflicted wound, I want you to remember that 90% of all cancers are what we call carcinomas. Let's go back to our slides and remember this drawing, the places that are exposed to the environment, the endothelial and the epithelium on the skin, are widely exposed to carcinogens. Now, carcinomas are cancers that are formed on epithelial elements. That's the definition. Carcinoma is not a general term. Cancer is the general term. If it forms in the mesothelium, it's called a sarcoma. 
So a muscle cancer is a myosarcoma. And we have cancers of the skin. There are basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. The lining of the duct of the breast is epithelium. That's a breast carcinoma, a duct cell carcinoma. Now, those cells, the epithelial cells, have the most rapid rate of replication. They turn over fastest. And so what cell are they going to have? They're going to have lots of stem cells. Those stem cells are going to be very, very active. They're going to be coming up all the time to replace the cells that are being lost on the skin, on the uh, lining of your intestines, the lining of your respiratory tract, even the lining of the breast ducts so that these cells are gonna have the most chance for malignant changes, exposure to the environment, and rapid stem cell turnover, and therefore 90% of our malignancies are gonna show up as carcinomas. The mesial, uh, mesothelial cells have very much reduced exposure, and so sarcomas are much, much rarer than the others. There are three big groups of environmental carcinogens, chemical, physical, and biological, and we need to look at those in order. Remember that there's a lot of problems associated with trying to pin a cancer on one of these elements as being the causative agent. First of all, there's decades of exposure, uh, and I'm sorry, of time between exposure and the development of the cancer that we can see. So what they got exposed to 30 years ago may cause a cancer now. How do we make the connection? Also, the amount of carcinogen is very hard to quantitate. And that's because, again, time, and we just don't know how much sun did you get, uh, how much of the cigarette tar did you actually get. And most carcinogens only produce cancer in a very small number of patients. Most of the time, our body's defenses will prevent cancer from occurring. So again, the connection is very difficult. Most smokers never get cancer, even though this is still one of our most common causes of death for cancer. So tobacco is the world's number one carcinogen, and we'll talk about the chemical group first. It causes 30% of cancer deaths of all the cancers combined, and if you add dietary factors, probably 50 or 60 percent of all cancer deaths. Very, very important carcinogen. Everything else pales in comparison to this, and it's one we have to spend almost no money on. If we got everybody to quit smoking, then we probably have 2,000 deaths a year from cancer instead of 200,000 deaths a year from lung cancer. So the money we're spending in research and prevention uh, could be spent on something else if we just get people to stop smoking. Alcohol also linked. It's another environmental carcinogen. And when combined with tobacco, is really very potent in causing cancers of the mouth and of the GI tract. And how often do you see somebody with a drink in their hand who doesn't also have a cigarette? These two habits tend to go together. Food additives in the dye industry cause cancer of the bladder. They get into the blood. The industrial workers get bladder cancers. Food flavorings can cause cancer. Certainly saccharin causes cancers in mice. Uh, the link in humans is still a little fuzzy. I've talked to you about aflatoxin B. Cooking methods, smoking charcoal, produce nitrites, which have been linked to some cancers. And there are industrial chemicals that are a huge cause of cancer. They come from the environment, not only for the workers, but for people in agriculture and people in the general population. These are usually big molecules. They are things like vinyl chloride used in industry. Here's what a chemical formula looks like. Here's the chlorine, a couple of carbons and hydrogen atoms making this molecule. But the big group as a group of chemicals is the cyclic hydrocarbons, and these include the benzene ring. And the benzene ring gets combined with other chemicals, and this is without all those other uh, letters on there, but basically each joint here is a carbon, 
and various cyclic hydrocarbons called polycyclic hydrocarbons are linked to can uh, cancers of many, many forms. Also, lymphomas, which should be called now, as you probably know, uh, lymphosarcomas because they occur in mesothelial tissue. Those cancers still are called lymphoma by general agreement. They're very controversial, but probably herbicides are very important in the development of them. Uh, there's strong industry bias in getting this nailed down very much like the tobacco industry. Diesel exhaust fumes are more carcinogenic than non-diesel. And urban air pollution is very important in that you're not only smoking, but you're heating up those elements through a fire, and then you get the, the, the tar products from the tobacco and the urban air pollutants, which are being heated up. And everything, all chemical reactions, go faster when you heat them up. So smokers in the city do worse than smokers in the country. Medicines for the final group for cancers, they probably produce about 1% of all cancer deaths, nowhere near in the category of tobacco, but chemotherapy can cause secondary cancers later. The immunosuppressive drugs, as I told you, cause lymphomas. Hormones can cause endometrial and breast cancers in large doses. Steroids cause liver cancers and so on. There's a just, a, a, again, a, an entire industry's worth of cancers. And one of the problems is you get down to a chart like this, certain cancers have not such a terrible incidence, 14%. Here's the incidence of lung cancer. But the mortality is enormous because it's so, so bad a cancer to have. Uh, breast cancer in women causes, again, more cancer but fewer deaths. It's easier to cure. And another factor, if you take all these into consideration, look what the effects of immigration are. In Japan, and this is some time ago, because things have changed, but the, here's the incidence, the deaths from cancers of the stomach was out here, forgetting the numbers. When these people migrated to California, there was a decrease and their children had a degree decrease, and it was very close to the rate of California native uh, Caucasians. What happens when people move is they pick up the habits in most cases and the environmental exposures of the new population they've joined, and as they assimilate, they tend to either increase or decrease or stay the same, depending on what the environmental causes was were of their kinds of cancer. Those are the chemical carcinogens. I'm gonna just talk for a minute on physical carcinogens. The important ones are asbestos, as you know, which is a physical injury to the cell. It probably spears the cytoplasm and the nucleus. They're microfibers, and they probably mix chemicals that never should have been mixed. Remember, we talked about those membranes to keep the chemicals apart. They cause mesothelioma, a kind of covering of the lung cancer. There's ionizing radiation, which is the kind of radiation that has a lot of energy and can move electrons in a molecule or in an atom and cause mutation in that molecule or that atom. And these are the two really big ones, the, the ionizing radiation and then UV radiation, ultraviolet light, as well as um, asbestos. It's an interesting controversy. Asbestos in the ground doesn't really hurt anybody. The miners have a problem. Asbestos that's probably in walls that are well sealed probably are less harmful than when you try to remove it because that's when you spread it to the workers. If we leave asbestos where it is and seal it off, it's probably going to do the most good in preventing these kind of cancers. Um, electromagnetic magnetic fields I have to talk about because it's always in the paper. There's really no hard evidence that there have been cancer increases because of electromagnetic fields. This is still very controversial. And nuclear energy is another one that comes up a lot because um, of the, the fact that radiation is emitted. As far as we know, in terms of the industry of nuclear energy, uh, it's a pretty clean industry, and there has not been 
uh, increases in cancer deaths except in places like Chernobyl. We did learn a lot about, uh, unfortunately, about cancer from our own experience in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that was how long and how much cancer you're going to get from this kind of radiation. We radiated more than 100,000 people. And the shortest lag period was about seven years, and that was from leukemia and mostly in children. Children were the most susceptible. Total body radiation caused, caused all, all the tissues to be at risk. So radiation in any dose is bad. The more radiation you get, the worse it is, up to a certain point, and I'll talk to that a little bit when I talk about treatment. Ultraviolet radiation, we now know that both ultraviolet A and B are carcinogenic. Finally, the third group uh, in this physical, chemical, and biologic are the biologic carcinogens, and the big player here are the viruses. They're called oncogenic viruses. Onco means cancer, genic means causing, and they carry DNA defects right to the cellular, uh, excuse me, the nuclear DNA in the cell. And this, of course, in this case, it would be stem cells. And that defect is brought to us courtesy of the viruses in a very interesting cycle. Hepatitis B and C are associated with liver cancers. I'm going to tell you in more detail how those viruses work. But right now, we're just going to review who the players are, what kind of diseases they cause. Uh, the human papillomavirus, papilloma means polyp, it's a virus that causes uterine cervical cancer and cancer of the male genitourinary tract. It's highest in women with multiple sexual, sexual partners. It's highest in women who are prostitutes or women whose partner had multiple sexual partners. So the chance of getting this virus and the chance of then getting cancer from it goes up with the level of unprotected sex and what is called in medicine promiscuity, meaning promiscuity, meaning multiple sexual partners. Human T cell leuke uh, leukemia is an interesting one. It's one we don't see here a lot, but it is related to a viral infection. And finally, HIV causes something called Kaposi sarcoma. This is a disease that was a very, very benign kind of cancer, one that wasn't very aggressive. It occurred in the skin of elderly men, mostly around the Mediterranean uh, coastline in Italy, places like that. And then came HIV, and it did something to the nature of that cancer that made it very aggressive and very virulent. So in the framework of an HIV infection, Kaposi sarcoma, you know that's a mesothelial tissue that grows up through the skin, Kaposi sarcoma is a much more uh, deadly cancer. HIV is also linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as well as Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, both of which uh, are cancers of the cells of the immune system. We talked about that earlier. Epstein-Barr virus is really interesting because Epstein-Barr virus is everywhere. In this country, there's a huge population that has had Epstein-Barr virus infections in the past, it's given them relatively mild diseases called mononucleosis, the kissing disease. But in other environments, in other parts of the world, they cause cancers such as lymphoma, such as cancers of the nose and the pharynx, the back of the mouth, in populations like Arctic Eskimo. So there's a lot of factors going on there um, that are causing this, and we're not clear about uh, most of them. Finally, uh, there is Helobacter pylori. Helobacter is a benign stomach ulcer in, uh, residing bacterium. It's a little rod. It lives in the ulcer of the stomach. It brings with it its own enzymes to produce ammonia, which neutralizes the acid so it can live very happily in the ulcer. And where we used to treat these ulcers with antacids, we now treat them with antacids plus antibiotics. However, over the long term, they can cause gastric cancer. And uh, this is the only bacterial infection that we know of that's associated with cancer. 
So the real players in biology, as I said, are the viruses, and we'll look at the specific ways that they do this. So these, if you haven't noticed, I'm talking about cancers in somatic cells, cancers that occur in body cells and organs that are not germ cell related. They're not related to, for example, the sperm or the ovum. When we talk about genetically transmitted cancers, we're talking about mutations that occur in one of the two germ cells, the sperm or the ovum, are then transmitted to the offspring, and since that defect is in every cell of that patient, then you have something called a predisposition syndrome. Any cancer can have at least a two or three fold or two or three hundred percent increase in incidence if there's a family history. Um, for example, there's something called retinoblastoma, a very serious malignancy on the back of the eye occurs in the um, uh, retina. And if you have the genes passed on from both your parents for this, you can have a 10,000-fold increase getting this cancer. And unfortunately, it occurs in infants. It requires usually the removal of the eye, and it is an autosomal dominant gene. So it occurs in the somatic cell, and it is a dominant gene, meaning you only have to have one mutation to get this. I'll talk more about this gene later on. There's something called xeroderma pigmentosum. Xeroderma means dry skin. Pigmentosum means pigmented. These patients have a recessive gene that they get from their parents, which impairs the ability of their DNA to make repairs on UV-damaged skin. So when they get a sunburn, it has a huge chance of turning into cancer, and in fact, these people can virtually never go out in the sun. Their skin has no repair mechanisms, and they need to be completely protected, or they will get hundreds of skin cancers. You've probably heard about uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2, sometimes called BRCA1 and BRCA2. These are genes, which I'll tell you more about again, that are linked to about 5% of breast cancers. So while they really raise the incidence or the chances of the mutated form leading to breast cancer, they don't occur in many patients. And then there's something called the Lee-Fraumini syndrome, in which there is an inherited defect in a gene called P53, which is a repair gene. We'll talk about that at great length. But when that repair gene is damaged, this increases the chance for cancer in multiple levels of multiple cancers. Patients of all kinds get all different cancers when they have the Lee-Fraumini syndrome. Now, having said all that, in this long talk about genetic susceptibility, first of all, only about 5% of patients are affected. And what I mean by that is if you take all cancer patients, only 5% of them have a link to these genetic disorders. They are very useful to us because they help us understand the pathogenesis and the etiology of cancer. But... Now, here's the, here's the caveat. Most patients with a family history never get breast cancer. That's number one. Number two is most patients who get cancer have no family history. When I say most, I'm talking about 80%. What this means is there's nothing that we can do with family history unless it's very, very extreme. The translate translates into how you take care of a patient. When I have a patient sitting across the desk from me, it doesn't matter if she's had a family history of breast cancer or not. I will be no less careful in physical exam, in ordering mammograms, in surveillance of this patient, whether or not she's had the family history. Now, the same goes with all the rest of these. So what we do in medicine in the real world and what we talk about on paper are really two different things. You have to look at every patient as if they could have the disease, and except in real extremes, a woman who has mutations in both BRCA1, BRCA2, 
whose mother had premenopausal breast cancer, who has two sisters with bilateral premenopausal cancer. That's different. That's, first of all, very, very rare, but it's a totally different issue. That patient is going to have to have more screening. Finally, chronic inflammation. If you irritate us enough, hepatitis leads to hepatocellular cancer. Even cancers of the skin occur more in patients with chronic scars, with long-term burn healing, because of the constant turnover rate that occurs in chronic inflammation and regeneration, leading to less time for turnover, more genetic errors, and more stem cells coming into play. Next time, we'll take a really close look at the molecular mechanisms of how all this plays out.